tech terms and what they mean. So the subject of today's presentation, um, we're going to be going over some common terminology that you need to know and understand in order to understand today's um, tech market. You might have heard these terms being thrown around a lot. Maybe you don't know what they mean. Maybe you have a slight idea. But today we're going to be going over some of the more important ones that will help uh, assist you um, when you do things like use the internet and use various softwares. But it is um, worth noting that this is not a complete list. There, is, there are plenty of topics and terms not covered here that are very important. So we, we, are, um, we try to include as many as possible. And this also, these aren't, how to say, like textbook definitions. They've been like simplified slightly because some of them are very technical, but we tried our best and yeah. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them for the end. We're going to go into breakout rooms where you can ask them towards um, a smaller group of volunteers. If it's really urgent, you can ask, but the breakout rooms are preferable. So let's start. The first term we're going to analyze is VPN. So for those of you who were here for the webinar on Monday, we had a very long discussion at the end about Wi-Fi and security. So suppose you're in Tim Hortons or somewhere else and you're using someone else's Wi-Fi, using public Wi-Fi, and you want to stay private and stay secure, a VPN is the best tool for this. So what a VPN does is it um, helps hide you from other people. It's a bit like if a website is a house, a VPN is like wearing a mask. And it's, um, it's a very useful tool, especially in today's era of big technology companies, if you want to remain private while you browse the internet. Um, and the way VPNs work is by masking your IP address. So an IP address is a, um, is a number or a string of numbers that's unique to you and your device. So it's like a number that defines you. So if someone perhaps with malicious intent can track your IP address, they can track you. So if we go back to the previous one, VPNs work by masking or changing your IP address. So yeah, it's a very useful tool. Another note about VPNs, if any of you are interested in using one, they, are, they aren't usually free, so you'll need to buy them, but they are very uh, useful. And you can also change which country your IP address comes from. So it's a pretty useful tool. The next term we're going to go over is CPU. So the analogy this uh, blur of text gives is that it's the brain of the computer. And this is a good analogy. It does function very much like a sort of brain of the computer. So CPUs are composed of these tiny things called transistors. Transistors are like on and off switches for the passage of electricity. And when you put tons of transistors, like a whole lot of them, into a CPU chip, it becomes a processing unit. And it does the like computational tasks required for you to run your computer. If you, for those of you who have laptops, maybe at the bottom right or bottom left of your palm rest, there'll be a small sticker that says Intel Core i5 or something. Um, Intel and AMD are both companies that make CPUs and they make good ones. So yeah, the CPU is the brain of the computer and it performs calculations. Now we're going to be learning about front end. So whenever you're on a website, you always interact with it somehow. There are buttons you click, there are menus you interact with, things like that. So front end refers to all the components of a website or a program that you interact with directly. So yeah, if there's like a search bar, you click on it and you type into it, there's a button you press, this is all front end. And back end refers to the components of a website or program that you don't directly interact with. These are usually things like uh, databases. So suppose you are on a website and it wants you to subscribe to a newsletter or something. So you give your email. Well, once you give them the email, what do the guys who own the website do with that information? They serve it on, they save it on a database and they do things like that. That's what backend refers to. And a, uh, an extra fact, um, developers and programmers who do both front end and back end web development, they're called full stack developers. They know both ends. So we're going to be learning about the two most important aspects about front end. 
So HTML is an acronym, it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And it refers to all the elements, all the basic elements that comprise a website. If you see an image, that's HTML. If you see text, that's HTML. If you see a link, that's also HTML. And the other important part of full end, or sorry, the other important part of front end is CSS. And CSS is like the artwork. There are colors, images, font sizes, um, animations, things like that. So a, a useful analogy to think about it is, um, suppose you're a painter, HTML is a bit like the canvas, and CSS is the paintbrush you use. I have a cool little thing to show you. This is a picture of a website, and it only has HTML. It doesn't have anything else. It, doesn't, it only has HTML. You can see that there is text, but it's all ugly. There are links. There are, there are a bunch of things. But this is what a website looks like with just HTML. But when a skilled programmer adds CSS, it can look something like this. As you can see, it has different fonts, it has symbols, it has like colors, images, there's like animations, things like that. So CSS refers to the things that make it look good. They're like your paintbrush. Um, all right. And now we're going to be talking about RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. And it refers to the short-term memory that your computer can use in the moment to perform certain tasks. So I'll give you a scenario. Suppose you're on Google Chrome or Firefox or any internet browser, and you open 100 tabs. Let's say you open 100 tabs. If you have a lot of RAM, you can perform tasks on all of those tabs. You can use all of them, and your computer won't slow down, and it won't start acting weird. If you don't have a lot of RAM, when you load up your 100 tabs, it'll be really hard for the computer to keep up with, all you, with what you're doing. So it refers to the capability your, your computer will have on the spot to do things like use Google Chrome and things like that. OK, AI. AI refers to a type of machine or a program that attempts to replicate the processes of a human brain. The process by which an AI does that is called machine learning, and it's a very new and exciting field in data science. Basically, they try and get computer programs to learn the same way a human can. So a fun example of this is, uh, if any of you know about the game of chess, there are engines in chess which are only given the rules of the game. They're not given, given anything else. Then they play like 10 billion games. The computer plays 10 billion games with itself. And it learns how to play from scratch. This is an example of an AI. And futurists and theorists like to think about what happens when AI becomes sentient or self-aware, when they become quote unquote alive. We don't need to go into that today. Biometrics. So they refer to um, identifications and processes electronically that use biological aspects of yourself. So many phones nowadays have fingerprint scanners that you can use to open the phone and use it. A newer type of biometric is called Windows Hello Facial Recognition. So if you have a Windows computer, if it's a very, very new one, your computer will be very special and it can recognize your face and log you in that way as though your own face was a password. So it says, for example, unlocking an iPhone with a fingerprint, other phone companies do that too. Cloud computing. So we had a webinar on cloud computing some time ago. And for those of you who wish to learn more, I recommend you go see it. But here's a useful analogy to explain what it is. So in your house, unless you have like solar panels or your own geothermal system, you don't actually generate electricity yourself. When you turn on a light bulb or turn on your computer, it eats up electricity from somewhere else, like a generator. Now, in this scenario, replace electricity with computational power and you have cloud computing. It's when you uh, store information and make use of computational abilities like storing videos, storing photos, making presentations, except you outsource the, compu the computing power the same way you get electricity from a power plant. So that's cloud computing. Now we have the Internet of Things, which is exactly what it sounds like. It refers to like a system of interrelated objects that are all connected to the Internet. If, um, so I'm pretty sure nowadays there are even toothbrushes that connect to the Internet. Um, 
virtually there will come a time when virtually everything is connected to the internet and the internet of things refers to the totality of that so you can buy things like google home uh, so like lock doors and run security cameras and things like that the internet uh, even your alarm clocks and your phones once everything is connected to the internet it is called the internet of things cookies so cookies are small pieces of data or information that are stored on your computer uh, once you visit a website. And when you visit the website a second time, the website will look at your cookies and remember you. And it will do certain things with those cookies to make your life easier. For example, um, suppose you're on Amazon and you have a shopping cart filled with things you want to buy. Um, Amazon will recognize the cookies you have and using the, your cookies will identify, oh, this is, this is Daniel. And these, this, these are the items on his shopping cart. If you have different cookies, they won't have the same shopping cart. So applications like shopping carts and other things use your cookies. As I said, it um, personalizes your internet experience, is a good way of putting it. A browser cache. So um, browser cache is a location on your computer that stores static elements of a website. So what do I mean by static elements of a website? If you visit a website, then come back after 10 days and visit it again, the aspects of the website that don't change and remain the same, those are called static elements. And remember we talked about HTML and CSS, the, like the canvas and the paintbrush? Those are examples of static elements. They stay the same. So in order to load websites and stuff like that faster, your computer will store some of the static elements like on, on, on your own computer so that when you load the website again, it'll be much faster and more enjoyable. Plugins. So plugins are extra additions or extra software that you can add to something that don't originally come with the package. So I'm going to tell you about a very special type of plugin. It's very useful. Um, this thing at the top right, you guys can see that it's called Adblock. Basically, whenever I'm watching YouTube or on a website, advertisements often get in the way and it's very annoying. So if I'm watching a YouTube video, there'll be two advertisements at the beginning and I have to waste time looking at like lemonade, vodka or Buick or something that wastes my time and I don't want to watch it. So this plugin I add to Google Chrome. It's not part of Google Chrome, but I added it so that it blocks advertisements and makes um, my internet experience more enjoyable. And there are many different types of plugins you can use. And uh, there, if, for those of you who, you who use Google Chrome, um, you can buy or not buy, download plugins and extensions in the Chrome Web Store. So yeah, this is the website you use. RSS feed. Um, a set of text files that updates the reader on new information such as the news or an article. Simple enough. I, I don't use RSS feed that much, but it's if, if you want to know, it's there. Sandbox. So a sandbox is what software developers and programmers use to test uh, code and programs in a controlled and safe environment, uh, free from malware. So if they have a program before releasing it to the public or before selling it to a company, they'll test it in their little sandbox to make sure it works and everything works all right. Then they'll send it out. So it, it's, it helps protect against um, hackers and malware and things like that. SEO, this is an acronym that stands for Search Engine Optimization. So news websites and other websites will actually pay people or to perform search engine optimization on a website. So when you go into Google and type in, for example, let's see, um, Albert Einstein. Notice how everything comes in a particular order. First you have Wikipedia, then you have the Nobel Prize website, then you have the Encyclopedia Britannica. It all comes in a certain order. Um, search engine optimization means that if a website is very optimized for a search engine, it'll appear, it'll appear higher up and more people will visit it. This includes like key phrases or key terms or combinations of terms that a website will make use of so that it appears higher on the, when, when you Google it and 
and they'll get more clicks and therefore more ad revenue and things like that. UI. UI uh, refers to user interface. So software companies and other programming companies will hire people called UI designers. And it's their job to make um, interfaces that you can interact with. So does everyone here remember Windows 8? Windows 10 is the latest one, but Windows 8 was the one before that. For those of you who do remember it, you'll remember that the UI was horrible. It was really bad. There were two start menus. No one liked it. That's why they had to change to Windows 10 really quickly. There's some other reasons too, but UI refers to how easy it is to interact with something. Um, something that has a bad UI will be really hard to use. They'll have tiny buttons. It'll, it won't look nice, and it'll be really hard to get meaningful information out of. URL. So if websites or houses, URLs are like their postal codes or addresses, they're the um, specific, like that HTTP colon slash slash www dot blah, blah, blah dot com. That's the URL. It's the address of the house or the URL of the website. In fact, it's often called web address for that reason. So here we have cross-platform. A software that's cross-platform can work on multiple computers. A very common and easy example is Microsoft Word. Um, I can open Microsoft Word on an Apple device. I can open it on a Dell or Windows computer. I can open it anywhere. And if I log in with my Microsoft account, I can work on the same documents on the computer I'm using right now or one, another computer. And it's, it works on multiple platforms. So here in this diagram, you see there's like a phone, tablet, a laptop. It'll work on all of them. So PowerPoint is another example, but that's what cross-platform means. Open source. Open source refers to software that is accessible to the public, and so anyone can use it. Uh, an easy example are like web browsers. So Google Chrome and Firefox and Microsoft Edge and other things used to browse the internet, these are open source. You can just download them from anywhere. Anyone can download them, and they're readily accessible by the public. So that's what open source means. And here's a useful website you can use. If you encounter terms that you don't know about, suppose there's a term that wasn't mentioned here and you want to know what it means, you can go onto this tech terms website and you can search for, like, for example, suppose I want to know what JavaScript is and it'll tell me what JavaScript is. It's a programming language used in web developments. Great. So if there's things you want to know about that weren't covered here or you want to learn more information, you can use tech terms and websites like it to learn more. And that's the presentation. Thank you for listening.